Are you looking for a car to complement your individual style, but you don't want anything ostentatiously big? Keep on watching, because the DS4 may be just what you need. What is the DS4? It's the next model in the DS lineup sitting above the DS3 Crossback and below the DS7 Crossback and the DS9 flagship. The DS is a Citroën-derived luxury brand in the Stellantis Group. Almost 70 years ago, Citroën revolutionized the automotive world with the DS model. More than a dozen years ago, Citroën decided to take advantage of the well-recognized model name and first turned it into a sub-brand and then made it a standalone brand. All this in the name of better utilizing platforms and components within the group or, to put it bluntly, luxury DS yields higher margins than the popular Citroen brand. The first DS3, DS4 and DS5 models were largely Citroens with slightly more interesting exteriors. The DS3 Crossback, the DS4 and the DS7 Crossback as well as the DS9 are now design masterpieces outside and inside. The DS is great with lights. In the more expensive models, the headlights do this welcome dance. Here, as you approach the car, various elements light up as if to say, hello. It's a nice touch. The DS4 is something between a compact hatchback and a crossover. It's a close cousin of the Peugeot 308, but as far as the shape is concerned, it's closer to the BMW X2, the Lexus UX or Mercedes-Benz GLA. Size-wise, it even gets close to the Range Rover Evoque and the Volvo XC40, although those two have more boxy backsides. The Citroën DS4 can be ordered in this hatchback-like version or as the Cross, which has bits of black plastic around the corners and is therefore supposed to look more like a crossover. Before I take you for a drive, I have to talk about the door handles. With a DS, you can never be sure if the door handles will work or not. Sometimes, as I approach the car, the door handles pop out just in time, and sometimes they don't. And that's when I actually have the key on me. And when the key is inside and the door handles are retracted, getting them out can be complicated. I guess I have to press the handle for it to pop out, and sometimes it does. Why do car makers feel obligated to make simple elements so complicated? To answer your question about why would I leave the key inside, here, like in the Peugeot 308, you can't turn off the proximity sensor. I mean, I thought I did, but either it reset itself or there's no such possibility. Anyway, as I leave home and walk towards the gate, I pass next to the car, which opens and locks with a beep. I don't need that late at night or early in the morning when the neighbors are sleeping. More about the interior and the DS4 practicality later on. It looks interesting. And now let's go for a drive. The DS4 is available with a petrol, diesel or a petrol-based plug-in hybrid powertrain. The petrols include a 1.2-liter 3-pot producing 130 horsepower or a 1.6-4-pot producing 180 or 224 horsepower. And then there is the inline for 1.5-liter diesel as well. That's 130 horsepower. All of these work with 8-speed automatic gearboxes. The 180 horsepower petrol engine is also used in the PHEV, which, together with the electric motor, outputs 225 horsepower. It's called the e tense and this is what I'm reviewing here. It's the same powertrain like in the Peugeot 308 GT Pack I reviewed a few months ago. 
The electric motor draws power from a 12.4 kWh traction battery, claimed electric range is up to 55 km. Once the battery level is low, the car goes into regular hybrid mode, which works more or less like a Toyota hybrid. The electric motor either helps or, for a short time, replaces the petrol engine in order to optimize fuel consumption. I drove the Peugeot 308 during the winter and out of the claimed 60 km electric range I got less than 40. I'm driving the DS4 in the spring with daytime temperatures around 20 degrees Celsius. In the city I managed to drive 50 km in electric mode. Depending on the spec you can have a 3.7 or 7.4 kW onboard charger, so charging takes anywhere between 2 and 6 hours. Although driving on a motorway in electric mode doesn't make sense because of high energy consumption, you can drive on electric only up to 140 km per hour. However, in order to achieve that speed, you need to be gentle with the throttle, push it harder and the petrol engine kicks in. The petrol engine will come on every time you floor it. It's not like the Lexus NX 450H+, which can be forced to drive in electric mode only. Speaking of flooring, they claimed 0 to 100 km per hour time in 7.7 .7 seconds and I managed 7.9 seconds in sport mode and 8.5 seconds in normal hybrid mode. Once the traction battery is depleted, on the dual carriageway the DS4 uses about 7 to 8 liters per 100 km. But even in hybrid mode, the DS4 feels a bit down on power, the Peugeot 308 felt more dynamic. The DS stands as a brand because it offers advanced features which are unavailable in mainstream models. For example, even this compact hatchover can have adaptive suspension with road scanning technology. Here it's called the DS Active Scan Suspension and it scans the road ahead and prepares the car for things like bumps and stuff. Tech like this is available on flagship premium cars or even on luxury models like those offered by Rolls-Royce. Does it work? Well, kinda sorta. In the DS7 Crossback it was easy to find the limit of the system, which scans the road ahead of the car, but turning 90 degrees into a dirt road system needed some time to recalibrate. In the DS9 the suspension sometimes made unpleasant noises like DCC and VW group cars. They used to do that back in the day. Anyway, I suspected it could have been related to low temperature, but I could not replicate it to the camera. Now in the spring, I get the feeling that sewer covers may be the culprit. I think the system recognizes a sewer cover, but it assumes it will be aligned with the tarmac. <laughs> How naive. On the plus side, the adaptive cruise control and the lane keeping assist work well. Compared to the DS9, all the active cruise control buttons are now on the steering wheel, like in the Peugeot 308. Also, the system is better calibrated and it doesn't keep reminding me to keep my hands on the wheel all the time. And finally, I found use for the DS9 vision system. I mean, I know it's supposed to recognize pedestrians and animals up to 200 meters away and warn me, however, in the Peugeot 508, it didn't work as well. Or the moose is bigger and more interesting than pedestrians. Soundproofing is decent, but visibility is an issue. The A-pillar limits visibility at crossroads and a falling roofline limits visibility in the rearview mirror. I recall having a similar problem in the previous gen Toyota Igo of all the cars. Rear visibility can be improved somewhat if you drop the seat lower, but then you won't be able to see outside in the front because the window line is rather high. So I had to raise the seat, something I don't usually do. By the way, the electric seat only works when the ignition is on. In the DS4, I can see new interior elements shared with the new Peugeot 308. Beside the buttons on the steering wheel I mentioned earlier, the receded new gear selector replaced the lever. Gone is the analog clock, which was once the sign of a premium car. Today, it's all about the screen real estate. And speaking of the screens, the driver's display is smaller than in the DS9 and the graphics are less diamond focused. Diamonds also disappeared from the main infotainment display. The only diamond is on this rather unusual lower display. So what is this small display for? It seems like sort of a touchpad or maybe a place where you would put shortcuts. Mm. Yes, but no. Long press the small screen and a shortcut menu will appear on the main screen from which then you can select items using the smaller screen to point 
In the OEM SatNav, you can also pinch to zoom and write the address using your finger. However, in order to input an address, you first need to tap Search on the large screen. And handwriting recognition leaves a lot to be desired as well. There are some basic voice commands like climate control settings and navigating to preset destinations like home or work, but this is no Mercedes. Set temperature to 20 degrees. I'm hot. Navigate home. The infotainment system is some sort of a variation of what we seen in the Peugeot 308 but over there it seems more logical and the shortcut panel up here is actually much better than the half-baked touchpad thing down here. There is a 360 camera but in the rear view we see the sprinkler. Couldn't they make it a millimeter shorter? Also the infotainment system takes ages to load and sometimes I'm already reversing but the system is informing me that, oh, my profile has just loaded. Now, there are basic physical buttons for the AC, but in order to actually set the temperature, you have to press a button, press a button, and now you've got your temperature climate control settings down here. The DS is proud of the invisible air vents. Well, I can see them. They just have silly controls. And the side air vents are now on the doors like in the DS3 Crossback. Power window switches are now on the top of the door like on a Land Rover and of course there is piano black plastic all over the place in your line of sight. The phone cubby is too small especially if you want to use the USB port and you will use it because Android Auto is not wireless. Add cup holders and it's getting really tight in there. I also don't understand why DS couldn't make a phone cradle under the armrest. This storage is ventilated, which would help get rid of the induction charging heat. You can fit one small bottle under the armrest. In the DS9, two bottles fit. The door pockets are okay. The glove box is average size at best. Crossover or hatchback doors cover the sills, and that's a good thing. Less good is that the sills are very thick and very high, and it makes it hard to get in, especially in the back, where the legroom is scarce. And this is with the driver's seat in my driving position. Now, turn off the ignition, and there goes the back seat. So this is what it would look like with a taller driver. There are air vents, two USB-C ports, door pockets, and an armrest with cup holders, as well as a ski hatch. The backrests split 40-60. The tailgate is electrically operated, but there is no gesture control, no swinging your foot under the bumper. There is just a button on the key fob and another button between the tailgate and the bumper. I suppose someone realized the tailgate release button next to the license plate is not as intuitive as the DS5 designers have thought. As this is a plug-in hybrid, the boot volume is 390 liters instead of 430 in the non-hybrid models. With the seats folded, there is 1240 liters. Of course, flat loading areas for sissies, as well as shopping bag hooks. Your haute couture shopping ride shotgun and your organic groceries arrive on a bicycle. The DS4 price list is complicated. The DS4 starts at 30,800 euro for the 130 horsepower petrol Bastille Plus. Some markets also get a more basic Bastille spec without the Plus. Then there are the Trocadero, Rivoli, both of which can be had as the Cross. And then there is La Première. And Bastille Plus can also branch out into Performance Line and Performance Line Plus. This test car is the e 10 Rivoli, which starts at €46,900. With options, it costs around €52,500. The DS4 is a car designed to emphasize your individuality at any cost, and I expect it will remain in that very niche. Having a choice between the reasonable Mercedes-Benz GLA and equally quirky Lexus UX or the more functional Range Rover Evoque, the DS is a very left-field proposition. And how do you like the DS4? Am I right? Am I wrong? Let me know in the comment section below. 
If you like my sarcastic, down-to-earth and possibly mildly amusing car reviews, join me every Friday at 3 p.m. Central European time and don't forget to subscribe and like this video as it helps me with the YouTube algorithm. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next one.